So Chinese Asia recently released a documentary series regarding the Singapore reserves. And I thought to myself, you know, Singapore investing related YouTube China documentary series about Singapore reserves. Hmm. Aha, why not? I do a reaction video relating to this documentary series. Eh? So, that's exactly how this video came about. But additionally, I also want to see if there are any lessons to be learned from how Singapore managed to reserve and how can apply it to personal finance and investing. And to be honest, there were definitely a few valuable pointers to be learned. So in this video, I'll break down some of these pointers using snippets from both the documentary series and the exclusive interview video with Singapore's Prime Minister. So yeah, let's dive right into it. Okay, first up, despite the vast amount of gold in Singapore reserves, a significant portion of the reserve is still tied to investments. But all this gold is just a tiny portion of Singapore's reserves. In fact, most of the reserves are not even in gold. Because like most investors who would look beyond gold if they really want to make big bucks, Singapore does too. Singapore is not unlike a successful businessman who has started to accumulate some savings. And after a while, he would think about how to uh, grow these savings rather than just leave it in cash. This reiterates the fact that if you really want to build a sizable retirement amount, we have to invest and not just solely rely on savings. Additionally, the earlier we start, the easier it will be. Similar to how it will be much harder for Singapore to build its reserves from scratch in this current day and age. You are not in the situation where we were growing in the 1970s and the early 80s. Growing 8, 10, 12 percent per year, running budget surpluses, 5, sometimes 10 percent of GDP, with salaries and therefore the possibility of putting aside some of this um, prosperity for a future rainy day. Today we are not as poor as we were before. Our incomes are higher, our standard of living is higher, but our expectations and our needs are also grown. So to say today you put aside systematically 2-3% of GDP and build up a sovereign fund from scratch, I think it is very hard. The economy will not be able to take it. While we may not have spending needs allied to that of Singapore, we will have more commitments to handle as we get older, be it mortgage payments, raising our children, or taking care of our aging parents. As such, as we get older, it becomes slightly harder to allocate funds for investing. Thus, it is best to start investing early when we have lesser commitments. This 88-page white paper in 1966 laid out what Singapore was most concerned about the safety of their foreign exchange reserves. You see, at that time, since Malaysia and Singapore shared a common currency, their currency-backing reserves were also pooled together. But when each became separate and sovereign entities, ownership of the reserves became a bone of contention. They wanted us to hand over whatever little reserves we have to Kuala Lumpur to manage against the issue of currency. So Dr. Ko says, no, Dr. Ko says, we can have a common logo, you know, but your currency, you issue against your own reserves. Our currency, we issue against our own reserves. And the reserve will remain in our hands. But I think uh, the Malaysian finance minister could not agree to that. And so, after 11 months of arduous negotiations, both the Singapore and Malaysian governments announced that they could not reach agreement for a common currency. As a result, beginning from the 12th of June 1967, Singapore and Malaysia will issue their own separate currencies. Similar to how Singapore chose to manage its own reserve shortly after independence, personal finance and investing for that matter is also very much personal. Yes, I know, we can depend on fund managers and financial institutions to invest our money for us. But if we do that, we prepare to pay a certain amount of fees which could then significantly affect your investment returns. Before we all start investing, we have to know our own risk appetite. The starting point in any investment strategy process is really a conversation about risk. And this is where we really engage with our client, our Ministry of Finance, and they tell us effectively how much risk they are willing uh, to take. And based on the government's risk preference, 
more than 60% of GIC's portfolio are in equities, which are basically shares in companies. The rest of the portfolio is made up of bonds and physical assets, like real estate and infrastructure. They usually come with lower risks. Depending on risk appetite, we want to allocate different proportions of our investments into different asset classes. At the end of the day, your investment portfolio should not cause you to lose sleep at night due to market conditions. In addition to portfolio allocation, another way to manage risk is to diversify your investments, just like how Singapore diversifies its investments with its reserve. You have to be invested all over the world, in America, in Europe, in China, in India, in the emerging markets. That year, investments outside of Singapore made up just under half of its portfolio. But over two decades, its overseas assets now far exceed investments in Singapore. A strategy that's also grown its total portfolio over fourfold. Today, more than 70% of Tomasic's investments are overseas. So that globally diversified portfolio is also an important part of uh, the Masik strategy to achieve growth uh, because there are also many good investment opportunities outside of Singapore uh, that they can tap on. From the Masik and GIC's portfolio, we can see that much of Singapore's investments are overseas. As a Singaporean investor myself, I think it's very important to look at companies from overseas and not just rely on Singapore-centric companies. After all, Singapore is a small dot on the world map. It doesn't mean that you have to look for companies based in overseas stock market. It could simply be companies on the Singapore stock market, but they have overseas revenue. Diversifying our investments overseas and in different countries also allow us to show ourselves from specific market conditions. Such that in scenarios where the Singapore economy is not doing well, we can actually draw on the reserves which are invested outside of Singapore. So it really is essential for us to, to travel. any good investor, we try not to put all our eggs in one basket and therefore we have investments all over the world. So for example, if there's a downturn specific to Asia, maybe the investments in Europe and North America may still be doing well. If you're wondering which country to diversify into, perhaps the way in which GIC diversifies its portfolio could provide some inspiration. We effectively have two big regions where our uh, capital is, uh, is allocated. So one is North America, where we have roughly about 35% uh, of the uh, portfolio. And the other big portion is actually in uh, Asia, uh, ex-Japan, uh, which is about a quarter, the two major global financial uh, centres. Societal trends and habits can also be another source of inspiration. Starbucks. But not the one in Singapore. I told the my mom I was going to Starbucks. Singapore, through GIC, has a 32.5% stake in the Korean franchise chain of Starbucks. Now, I don't want to speculate, but I think GIC's investment in Starbucks Korea could be linked to Korean's obsession with us Americano or coffee in their culture. Just saying. Besides diversifying based on asset classes and geography, our investments should also have a balance of both growth and income. I think PMD summarizes it best when speaking about returns from investments using the reserves. If you are only interested in dividend and interest payments, then instead of going for Microsoft, which the value of the share appreciates, but the, the dividends may not be much, you will go for a stock which pays you dividends, but the value never goes up. Utilities. And that's the wrong way to manage your reserves. It won't grow. You want it to grow. You want to give the managers the incentive to manage the reserves in an optimal way. The question of how much is enough always pops out about Singapore reserves. I don't know how much is enough. There is no such idea of how much is enough. How much will I need? I also don't know. Before uh, the global financial crisis, we didn't think we would need anything. When the global financial crisis came, it turned out we needed four or five billion dollars. When the COVID crisis came, in the end, we needed 40 plus billion dollars. So you have no idea how much you will need. 
because COVID is far from the worst thing that can happen to us. So what is the more productive way to think about this? I think the way we should look at it is, this is something which I have, I've put aside and I think about it as rainy day money. If it's not raining, I don't touch it. If it's a sunny day and I can afford to, I put a little bit more into it. Well, just like how Singapore strives to keep its reserve as much as possible, we should also do the same for our investment portfolios. It is after all an extra card to play in dire economic situations, be it from retrenchment or high fees due to unexpected life events. Besides being an emergency spare tyre, our investment portfolios can also provide an additional source of income on top of our daily jobs. In a way, this also diversifies our income sources, making you more resilient to unexpected economic shocks. A substantial investment portfolio can also provide generational wealth for both your children and your grandchildren. At the very least, it should lessen the burden on our children to provide for us in our retirement years. This is also how PM Lee describes Singapore Reserves as a tool to benefit future generations of Singaporeans. However much there is, I keep on having this attitude that I would like to build it up a little bit more when I can so that the next generation will be in a more secure position than I am today. And that's how I am here today and benefiting because my forefathers did that. And I think if we do this, our children and our grandchildren will benefit from that. And I hope they'll be grateful to us for that. No matter the asset classes or type of investments you invest in, or even the size of our portfolios, investments should always preferably be liquid, meaning that you can sell it easily on the market and lock in your investment returns should the need arise. This is similar to how PM Lee describes the type of financial assets that the Singapore Reserves are invested in. The answer is we wanted to put in all the things which mattered. What is it? Where is it? So in terms of what is it, it's basically financial reserve, financial assets, cash, shares, bonds, maybe private equity, some other financial instruments, you may own companies. And in Chinese, there's a phrase, pian mai tian tang. If you are desperate, what do you do? What you have, you convert it, you sell it, you pledge it, you pawn it. Whatever it is, you convert it, take cash and spend the cash. And what we wanted to do was to catch all the things which could be converted, which could be sold, which could be pledged, which could be pawned. And it's basically financial assets, companies and land. So, if our investment portfolio is tied to long-term investment thing policies or endowment plans, perhaps it's time to relook and readjust your portfolio accordingly. However liquid your investments are, it should not be a sign that it can be easily tapped on to fund your lifestyle. And of course, there's the idea, but when can we use it when we need it? And that's something which we discuss every now and again, which is that this is something precious. You lock it up twice, you think twice before you unlock it. You want to have guide rails, limits. This a realisation that yes, these are all resources available to the government, but some of it is daily spending money, some of it is budgeted for your short, medium term, annual needs, but some of it really, even as a working government, you should not think of as just part of the same pot of money. You should put it as a separate pot and this is something which you will only think of touching if you really, really need to touch it, which is only once in a while. Just like how there are guide rails for the usage of Singapore reserves, we should also have our own set of rules for touching our own investment portfolios. As a baseline, treating our investment portfolio like how Singapore treats its reserves is a good place to start, meaning we should only touch our investment portfolios in the worst of times. After all, like the reserves, our investment portfolios are our nest eggs for retirement and also an additional possible source of relief in the most dire of times. So for the first time, the government is dipping into its reserves. It will draw $4.9 billion to fund two temporary and extraordinary measures. In the past, when Singapore was building up its fiscal reserves, there was always a lot of questions about we're saving up for a rainy day 
when is the rainy day coming? The 2008 global financial crisis proved that it was a rainy day and Singapore basically had that big umbrella to take out and to shield you know, the Singapore economy from the worst effects of that downturn. In May 2020, just before Singapore exited circuit breaker, President Halima Yaakob approved this additional draw on the reserves. All in all, Singapore will spend a total of 72.3 billion Singapore dollars fighting COVID. The president approved a draw of up to 69 billion dollars. Eventually, only 40 billion was used from past reserves. The rest came from our operating budget. The portion that goes back to the reserves is important because if we don't have anything going back into the reserves, the value of the reserves will diminish over time. Our reserves, let's say it earns a return in real terms of about 4%. If we take half, it means 2% goes into the budget, 2% goes back into the reserves. Our economy is growing at about 2% every year. So if our reserves is growing at about 2%, and the economy is growing at about 2%, it means that our reserves is keeping pace, barely, with our economy. So it's not as though we are over-saving. This, and he says, why are you spending all of the income? Some of this should be put aside for the future. So then, question is, what is the formula to, for now, between now and the future? So Mr. Ong said, why not we just split it half 50-50? Half for now, half for the future, and therefore you spend half of the investment income, net investment income. Similar to how Singapore always reinvests part of the NIRC, we should also not treat our returns from investment portfolios, be capital gains or dividends, purely as cash we can use to fund our lifestyle. Instead, we should look to reinvest these returns as much as possible. At some point in time, he felt that the instruments they invested in were too short term and that if you trade carefully you can have higher yields. Dr Goh was a chess player and if you're a chess player you think several moves ahead. This man assiduously built up the reserves with a plan. I don't know what was the amount that the British handed us but what he did was to build on that amount a thousandfold over a spate of 30 years. Singapore current reserves were built over a period of more than four decades. This is a good reminder that investing is pretty much a long-term project and the goal is to have positive returns that either beat or are on par with the market returns. The ultimate objective of GIC is really to deliver long-term uh, real returns. Comment number one, Tomasek lost millions of dollars on failed investments. Mm. So I get questions about the uh, investment performance even for my family and friends and I think it's important to understand that every investment carries with it um, certain inherent risks. And we also have a dynamic component that we are oriented. We do not look at, for example, focusing on one uh, investment or two investments. We really look at portfolio as a whole. For us, I think it's very important to ensure that we are delivering sustainable returns over the long term. We are not affected by the short-term spike or the short-term trough that you know gets everybody too excited. Just like how Tomasi and GIC have a long-term view of the investments within Singapore reserves, we as individuals should also not be too affected or bothered by the market ups and downs. Of course, this is dependent on you investing in companies with good fundamentals. With that said, investing always comes with risk and at times our investment decisions can still go wrong. In such instances, we need to reevaluate what went wrong and not fully embark on a 180 degree change if our investing strategy has done well for us till date. This is similar to how Singapore manages the investment arm of GIC and Tamasic. There is no investment which is guaranteed to succeed. Sure win. If you think you see one which is sure win, it may be a scam. So you have to exercise judgment, you have to spread your bets, but you have to take risks. And sometimes the risks turn out well, sometimes the risks turn out badly. But if you have a competent team, if you have an honest team, if you give them the right mandate and mission, and you have the right governance process to make sure that the management of our reserves is properly done, 
then over a long period of time, you can be reasonably sure that the reserves will grow. But that depends on the professionals being the right ones, that they can do their job properly and not have political interference, either because the political leaders have a view you should do this instead of that, or because the public says, why is it that investment turn went wrong? Better sack the person. And unless we can shield them from these pressures, they won't be able to do their job properly, and our reserves will suffer. Once you have a successful investing strategy, it's also crucial that you stick by it and not be too influenced by what is happening in the media space. There will always be noise around whether the market is going up or going down. However, we have to remain steadfast and not be easily swayed by these news. After all, too many cooks can spoil a broth. Which also perhaps why the Singapore government does not interfere much with their ideas when it comes to investing Singapore's reserves. In GIC's case, the board doesn't go into individual investment decisions. The board sets the overall mandate, the risk limits, and the strategy. It chooses the key people and the professionals, and there are other governance committees within GIC who then do the actual investments. With that, I think there are most of the lessons that you can take from how Singapore manages its reserve. If you are interested in the documentary series and so the exclusive interview video, I provided the full links in the description below. Also, if you have watched the videos, let me know what are takeaways in the comments below. As always, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.